Welcome to October, October's offering from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's Department of African and African Diaspora Studies seminar series. This month, we are fortunate to have Dr. A.J. Rice with us. A.J. is going to be delivering his presentation on Searching for Roots, Black Study and the Tradition of Radical Black Political Economy, a topic that is one of immense importance and one which we have discussed uh, many years back together. And I'm so delighted to see it realized in a fairly new publication of a, a similar name. But let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Rice and his article, which appears in Souls, a critical journal of black politics, culture, and society. Dr. Rice has just taken a new appointment in the Department of Political Science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Congratulations to him on scoring that plum uh, professorship at uh, UC Santa Barbara. He currently holds the University of California President's Postdoctoral Fellow, a post at the University of California, Los Angeles in the Department of Political Science. He completed his PhD in African American and African Studies at Michigan State University, his MA in Politics from the New School for Social Research. And we were very fortunate to have him with us at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in the 2011 and 2012 academic year in which I was fortunate enough to have him in two of my seminars and to engage him in both discussions, formal and informal alike, often at our guest house a pub on campus with uh, our dear colleague and good friend, Patrick Belgard smith I remember those uh, conversations well and profited from them and enjoyed them immensely. Well, AJ, we have you here with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to your uh, presentation. And not only that, but just to follow your career going forward, I'm sure it's going to be a, a stellar one. And the fact that you're focusing on black political economy, I just think is fantastic. Uh, something which I think has been uh, 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 under uh, researched and to uh, see uh, this topic engaged in your capable hands is of uh, immense uh, delight and, and pleasure and reward for myself. So Dr. Rice, take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Summers. Um, so yeah, first let me thank you uh, for reaching out to me for, uh, for this talk today. And I also want to thank uh, Rachel for helping set up uh, this talk and for helping me with all the logistics associated as, as many of you know with, um, with talks. There's a lot of behind the scenes work. So I just wanna um, reach out and thank her for that as well. Um, I would also I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Dr. Mitchell Walthor Gladys, um, as well as the uh, Department of African and African Diaspora Studies uh, there at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, so let me kind of just jump right into the presentation uh, titled Searching for Roots, Black Study and the Tradition of Radical Black Political Economy. Now, this talk is loosely based on, a, uh, on an article that I just recently published uh, as Dr. Summers mentioned in the Souls Journal. Um, and so this work kind of grows out of interest that I've had for some time, but, but as was mentioned, especially uh, when I first arrived uh, to Milwaukee, when I arrived to, to Milwaukee in 2011, um, and, and the course that I had, courses that I had with Dr. Summers really kind of was one of my first introductions, kind of sustained introductions um, to kind of black radical thought, 20th century black radical uh, thought. And so that, that kind of experience um, deeply informed um, this, this, this presentation today, but kind of my work more, more generally. And so let me kind of uh, move, move on. So what I wanna do is provide first an overview of the presentation I'm gonna be giving today. Uh, so I want to start off with a couple of guiding questions, just to kind of orient the presentation. Uh, I want to provide a quick snapshot of Black life, particularly Black economic life uh, today, then move on to discussing the status of political economy in Black studies. 
uh, then discuss the tradition of radical black political economy. And I also want to kind of situate the tradition of radical black political economy uh, within a broader tradition of black political economy as well. And then, you know, make this uh, distinguished radical, this radical tradition uh, from that broader tradition. Then I, I have uh, next to discuss the transformational, uh, this question of a transformational black studies. And, and as you can see, there's a question mark there. Um, and so even when I was working through this article uh, for souls, um, there's a, a question that I've been having uh, about um, the prospects for really being able to create um, a black uh, a kind of a kind of black studies department or a kind of black studies um, unit within the broader academy. How how possible uh, or how you know what are the prospects for a kind of transformation, kind of radical uh, black studies within um, the broader academy? That's a, a question that I want us to kind of interrogate. And then I'll conclude and, and um, you know, and address some of the questions and, and, and thoughts that folks might have. So before I uh, move on, let me just briefly reference this quote from uh, UCLA professor historian um, Robin D.G. Kelly, who published this article in the Boston Review back in 2016 titled Black Study, Black Struggle. It's an excellent article and I'd really recommend it uh, to, Black, to, to, to all folks um, interested in uh, uh, kind of Black studies generally, but especially thinking about Black studies, um, uh, st students on campus who kind of see themselves as student activists or scholar activists. Um, I think especially in light of this moment um, and a lot of the activism that's been taking place over the past several years, I think it's a really important article to revisit. And what Kelly is doing in that article is he's speaking specifically to uh, Black activists on campus who, uh, in 2016, this is kind of in the aftermath of the University of Missouri's um, some protests there uh, that then sparked protests across the nation with students demanding uh, more Black Studies departments, programs, course offerings, um, also having um, uh, kind of better or greater kind of mental health services for, for students of color. And so one of the things that, that um, Kelly discusses in this article, he says he's sympathetic to those efforts, but he also um, suggests to, to activists that we not limit our ambit, right? We don't limit our focus to suffering or resistance or achievement only, right? That that's not enough. He says, quote, we must go to the root, to the historical, political, social, cultural, ideological, material, economic root of oppression in order to understand its negation, the prospect of our liberation. Going to the root illuminates what is hidden from us, largely because most structures of oppression and all of their various entanglements are simply not visible and not felt. And so um, I think that that's a very important um, uh, quote to kind of just orient us to get us, to get us kind of started with this, uh, this presentation. So the two guiding questions that I have here, First, what insights, concepts, and frameworks does the tradition of radical Black political economy offer that can help us excavate these roots that, uh, that Dr. Kelly was just talking about, these roots of race, class, and gender oppression today? Second, how might the tradition of radical Black political economy advance a transformationalist vision of Black study? And as, as you'll see, and we can kind of, I can interrogate this more um, even during the Q&A, but I make this distinction between Black studies and black study. And so one of, and I'm, I'm of course not the, the only one to, to, to do so. Uh, and so one of the major distinctions, kind of the main distinction of black study versus black studies is, is that black is that black study existed right before there was a kind of formal um, academic unit referred to as black studies or Africana studies or African and African diaspora studies, right? These this work on, on nomenclature that I know I think I believe Professor Winkler has been doing some work on uh, recently. And so, but, 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 so black study predates this institutionalization of this thing that we call black studies, right? This, this kind of study of, 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 of black life. Um, and I'm suggesting that, and, and so folks have suggested that there might be some limitations actually to this kind of institutionalization of black studies. So that's something that we can, we can explore more uh, today. So, like I said, I wanted to provide first just a kind of a, a brief snapshot of Black um, economic life, right? 
And so what I'm doing here in this particular slide is just giving a, a snapshot and looking at um, the median wealth among effectively single uh, white men, women, black men, and black women uh, across ages. And so this data comes from the Brookings Institute. Um, this report was published in 2020, but this, this data itself here is referencing 2019 um, um, statistics. And so what we see here from this, from this chart is that white men under the age of 35 have about uh, $22,640 of wealth, right, median. So that, that median number median number means that about half of the white uh, single male population has wealth above and below that, right? So that's a pretty decent amount of wealth if you're, if you're, under, if you're under 35. However, for single white women, that number is drastically lower. It's $6,470. For single black men, it's $1,550. And for single black women, it's $101. What this means then, is that the wealth of a single white of single white men under 35 is three and a half times greater than that of single white women, 14.6 times greater than that of single black men, and 224.2 times greater than that of single black women. And this disparity, as you can see, uh, tends to increase with age. Uh, another important uh, uh, fact to note, and this will be something that will come up again in this presentation, um, and is a core por, uh, point in kind of radical black political economy is also making a distinction, not just between in, uh, interracial uh, uh, wealth, but also making this intra-racial uh, distinctions as well. And so what we see is that black women for most of their life uh, actually hold, single black women hold, uh, have median wealth that is actually below that of black men. Right. And so the only time that that actually starts to change is when black women uh, start to, um, you know, the, the black women at the age uh, when they when they are older than 55. And so this um, snapshot here just kind of gives us a, a, a decent sense, right? There's all kinds of statistics that we could use, but I just wanted to kind of briefly uh, show this slide because I thought it did a good job of capturing some of the dynamics um, and inequality uh, and oppression that exists today and helps us to kind of orient us or help us to think through what you know, uh, what are the tools that might be able to help us um, explain this? Now, one of the things that this slide does not show um, is actually differences in data uh, based on gender and sexuality, right? Race, gender, and sexuality. And so to some extent, there are not great um, statistics for some wealth information uh, for, uh, based on sexual orientation uh, and, and as well as race in part because the federal government doesn't do a great job of, of collecting that data. However, we do know, for example, um, from some reports that in 2015, 38% of black trans folks were in poverty compared to 24% of blacks generally. So we know that black trans folk have, um, are, are actually, so that such that poverty and uh, the, the kind of US political economy negatively or disproportionately affects them. So it's not simply just race and class that we have to pay, uh, pay attention to, but it is uh, gender, uh, and gender and sexuality dynamics as, as well. Okay, so what is the current status of political economy in Black studies? There is a very important um, special issue that the Journal of Black Studies published in May of 2008 um, and so the data is slightly outdated. I have not seen um, a, a kind of more comprehensive or kind of updated uh, version of this data, but this, this report, and, and so I apologize, let me say, for the, the graph on the, or the chart on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, I, I just kind of wanted to just provide that there. This is directly from that, from that article. And so maybe, I know the, the um, font is very small, so hopefully, you'll be able to kind of pay some attention to it or be able to see some things. But um, on that left-hand side is kind of a list of all of the different uh, Black Studies departments, a select, it's about 33 Black Studies uh, departments and programs that were drawn from the National Council of Black Studies website. Um, and so then to the right of that, you have the core faculty, total core faculty members, uh, total affiliated faculty members. And then within each of those two groups, you have how many of those folks in those departments were actually economists, right? So these are core faculty members in Black Studies departments and programs 
um, and affiliated uh, faculty members in Black Studies departments and programs. Now, what I have on the right side is actually just effectively um, taking this bottom uh, uh, kind of calculation or tally on that left hand side of that graph. I've just kind of um, expanded that on the right hand side just for clarity sake. And so what we see here, right, is that basically over, um, there's about a total of over 600 uh, faculty, both core and affiliated faculty members in Black Studies based on the um, um, based on the sample for this particular survey. Now, out of that total, uh, 600 or so, you know, 600 plus faculty, only 11, only 11 of those faculty are actually economists. Right? So what that means is that about 1.75% of Black Studies faculty, roughly, and again, you know, this data is a little outdated, so, you know, we have a big caveat here, but at least from one of the most comprehensive studies that we have, less than 2% of Black Studies faculty are economists. <clears throat> That also correlates here, as we see, uh, and this is also taken from uh, this uh, report titled Excavating for Economics and Africana Studies. Um, what we also see is that uh, the low rate uh, of economics professors also correlates with the kind of low number of course offerings in political science and specifically economics and, and public policy. Now, what we should do is juxtapose that to this left side of the chart which looks at kind of some of the humanities. Um, and so as I argue in the article, what we see in black studies is that the humanities, um, that there's a much greater kind of weight towards and focus on humanities and humanities kinds of disciplines or foci in black studies uh, and methods and methodologies. However, uh, there is not as much of that kind of focus or even that kind of um, specific kind of expertise uh, uh, for economics and, and political science and public policy more generally. So in other words, political economy, as we can see from these uh, from this particular study, is significantly marginalized um, within the Black Studies uh, discipline. And so this is also something that Manning Marable uh, has mentioned, uh, the late Manning Marable had mentioned um, as well in a New York uh, Times interview in the late 1990s, which was a, a major concern for him as well. And so the the point here right is that the dearth of political economy in black studies hampers the discipline's ability to critically examine the root causes of black inequality and oppression right unnecessarily unnecessarily so now i've advocated i'm advocating that we need to kind of uh, have or that radical black political economy should occupy a more central role in the discipline. But of course, what I should do first is, is give you a sense of what is the black political economy tradition in the US uh, more generally. And then I want to kind of distinguish the radical tradition uh, from these other uh, traditions. And so what I did to kind of, um, to kind of um, 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 let's say separate these different traditions out is I used the, work of Michael Dawson, political, uh, political scientist out of University of Chicago, um, he actually defines six black political ideologies. Um, and so what I did is I basically distilled those six ideologies into four uh, general ideologies. And so those six that he, he discusses, he talks about uh, three that he refers to as liberal uh, ideologies. So he refers to um, uh, radical egalitarianism, disillusioned liberalism, and conservatism as effectively three kind of liberal traditions. Um, so I take though I you know parse out conservative here, um, talk about you know kind of collapse those other two under the liberal rubric. He also talks about black nationalism, uh, black feminism, and uh, uh, black Marxism. Uh, as well. And so for black feminism and black nationalism, I kind of have or black feminism and, and black Marxism, I've collapsed under the radical orientation. Uh, and I've, I've preserved the nationalist um, orientation here. And so what a liberal kind of political economy tradition is generally focused on or, or privileges or, or kind of looks at um, is, is it sees America as fundamentally racist, uh, but it's hopeful, right, that it can be redeemed. In other words, there is not a kind of abolition or um, a kind of fundamental restructuring of the nation, generally speaking, that liberals um, adhere to. The architecture of American democracy, therefore, um, of American capital can therefore be fixed. 
um, despite its, its deep flaws. For conservatives, they actually, Black conservatives, they actually believe that the US capitalist democracy is actually fundamentally good. It's not fundamentally racist. Uh, and as such, Black people must assert themselves and particularly engage in a kind of um, economic program, a kind of self-help economic program. And so that kind of becomes the way, the kind of path towards Black liberation uh, and Black success in, in the United States. Nationalists, however, um, fundamentally and outright reject um, the, the kind of US state as itself, a US uh, uh, kind of political economy as itself a kind of white project. Um, and so their argument is that Blacks should completely separate uh, either by forming a separate state or separate communities uh, from white America. And, and uh, that is kind of their um, approach. Now for radicals, right, um, radical Black political economy tradition is, is slightly uh, different. And one of the things I should say about the radical tradition at the, um, at the forefront is that it's not simply a tradition that is kind of born out of um, Black folks' engagement with Marxism or Marxism-Leninism, although that is part of it, but it's also deeply rooted um, in African traditions and in the history of African resistance itself, in a tradition of African resistance to um, white supremacy um, itself. Right. And so this is also, as you can see, kind of will draw also on some kind of black nationalist um, ideologies as, as well. And, and relatedly, I should make the point that although I've kind of categorized these various traditions, like any kind of category, there are overlaps, right? Um, and individuals can occupy one position and uh, at one historical moment and then a different uh, tradition in another moment um, or can kind of contribute to these various traditions at different times. So. Um, it's just obviously always kind of a caveat with respect to um, categorization. So in terms of the basic kinds of tenets of radical Black political economy, I've highlighted four here. Right? And so generally speaking, this tradition situates Black political, economic, and cultural experience and conditions within distinct historical epochs of global or what's referred to as racial capitalism. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, it also They also critically interrogate inter and intraracial gender and class dynamics. Uh, third, their politics and kind of political economic orientation is anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. So it's not just anti-capitalist within the United States, but it sees capitalism as a global phenomenon. Uh, and US capitalism in particular, it is very critical of uh, not just its manifestations domestically, but abroad, right? Um, and U.S. corporate imperial, uh, U.S. corporate power, um, and its and its influence over militarism and militaristic projects abroad. And finally, uh, they're principally concerned with the liberation of all oppressed peoples, right? Not just Black people, um, and not even just uh, the liberation of peoples. Um, in, for example, um, in, in, in colonial, uh, you know, in, in post-colonial parts of the world, but even white working class uh, in the US, right? And, and, and white workers abroad. So I want to, um, I'm not gonna discuss all of these folks here. I just kinda, and this list is not meant to be um, exhaustive uh, at all, but I did wanna just provide a kind of sample of some of the 20th century intellectual origins of radical black political economy. So these are some of the um, individuals and at the bottom organizations uh, that we see that have contributed significantly uh, to this tradition that I'm referring to as radical black political economy. And on the right, um, that's a picture of Claudia Jones, who, uh, who I you know, mentioned in the article and we'll have a few more things to say uh, about her today. And so, um, you know, I guess I'll, I'll make the point. So when talking about the new Negroes, so so um, one thing I should say about Du Bois, I think Du Bois is one of the, in his dissertation, which he published on the late 18, uh, late 19th century, he, Du Bois is actually um, examining the, the suppression of the, uh, of the Atlantic slave trade. And one of the things that he, he does in, in, in situating and in anal in analyzing his suppression uh, or the suppression of that, of that slave trade is he says that basically um, it was not ended earlier in large part because of the economic interests uh, uh, that were um, beholden to slavery in the United States. 
um, at the founding of the of the nation. And so this he, one of the things that he's trying to point out um, is this tension both between kind of economic interests and political interests, and, and not just economic and political interests, but economic interests in African oppression, right? And so and enslavement. And so for Du Bois early on, he's already pointing out this tension uh, between capitalism and the kind of expansion of global capitalism and the particular position that Africans are playing or the particular role that Africans have um, in that expansion of global capitalism and also uh, highlighting uh, why it's so difficult for um, the slave trade to, to be ended at a particular historical uh, moment. And so, in other words, what I'm trying to suggest is that Du Bois is already um, starting to engage in a kind of uh, early, this is already his kind of early um, orientation towards a kind of radical black political economy. We know, um, so so I'll, I'll, I'll move on. I'm gonna kind of go back to and, and engage some of these other characters, or some of these other individuals um, in, the, in the next few slides. But uh, as I mentioned, the traditional radical black political economy wants to situate, situate black experience, uh, generally situates black experience in these different epochs or these different eras of US racial capitalism. And so I've drawn on an excellent article by Sharice Burton Stelly that was um, published last year um, that looked at racial cap capitalism in the monthly review. Um, and so this quote that she has for racial capitalism, her definition, this is her theorizing of, of racial capitalism. She says that, quote, modern US racial capitalism is a racially hierarchical, racially hierarchical political economy constituting war and militarism, imperialist accumulation, expropriation by domination, and labor exploitation. Right. And so, um, in other words, in part, what, what uh, Burden Stelly is doing in this piece is trying to think about the uh, kind of global cap, the relationship between capitalism on the one hand um, and racial domination oppression on the other hand, particularly black oppression and domination on the other hand. And, sh and she's making the case that these two things are intimately intertwined, uh, interconnected, and developed together, right? Um, and so another important caveat, however, for her definition is that she's actually, when referring to modern US racial capitalism here, she's actually talking about uh, US racial capitalism after World War I. And I can get into why she's saying that, but I, I think that nevertheless, her, her uh, definition is useful for us. Um, one, just to kind of operationalize and try, try to get a sense of what is racial capitalism. Um, but I also think it's useful when thinking about what I kind of see as these three epochs of US racial capitalism. First, and now this is not, of course, the beginning of, uh, of, of, of African or African American history uh, in the United States, but uh, first you have slavery, right? This kind of first era um, or epoch is slavery. And it's really based upon a kind of agrarian or kind of agricultural mode of economic production, um, but also a particular kind of um, politics and a particular kind of political system, one obviously that um, condones and defends um, and upholds slavery. <clears throat> then there is a transition uh, to the Jim Crow period of US racial capitalism. Um, and so this also tends to coincide with kind of a declining of the agrarian uh, economy and the rise of kind of industrial uh, capitalism in, in the United States, as well as uh, expansion of um, US colonial project abroad. And so that's where you can see that this um, now definitely aligns with uh, Burton Stelly's definition of racial capitalism. And then basically in the late 1970s, particularly 1980, um, the election of Reagan kind of becomes this moment of a kind of new era of US racial capitalism, one that we are living, currently living in, and that is this kind of neoliberal uh, era of, of racial capitalism. And so one of the kind of key um, distinguishing factors about the neoliberal era is the increasing rise of, of corporate power um, and, and, and the um, ideologies of free market um, that tend to dominate our life, but also certain, certain particular corporations that dominate our life as well. So we've moved from this kind of period of industrial um, capitalism. And, you know, if you think I'm from Detroit, so, you know, we think of, um, you know, the uh, auto industry, right? And so, uh, and, and manufacturing. So we've kind of switched from this kind of period of manufacturing now to this kind of 
period where financialization and financial services um, tend to really dominate the US economy. And so I have this slide here. It's just a, um, just a kind of quick um, glimpse of what I'm talking about. And so what this, what this um, chart here shows is that particularly after 1980, Right, financial firms um, started to take a larger share of all corporate profits uh, in the United States, right? And so you can see um, basically their corporate profit, their, their share never uh, of corporate profits never exceeded 15%, basically never uh, exceeded 15% until after the 1980s, right? And so then there's been this significant rise. You see this sharp uh, decline right around, you know, as a result of the 2007-2008 um, the home foreclosure crisis, which itself was predicated in large part on predatory lending towards uh, Black and, and Latin, Latin, Latinx peoples. Um, and so uh, you can see that that exploitation uh, of, 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 of minorities and of Black folks in particular um, becomes also critical uh, for this phase of racial capitalism as well. So, um, as I've mentioned, radical black political economy, race, class, and gender. This is so race, class, and gender are the three kinds of areas that I focused on um, in the article, right? And so I want to kind of, I'll actually gonna read a, a couple passages from the article if you can, if you can bear with me. Um, I did want to so I mentioned Du Bois earlier and kind of theor, his, he did not use the phrase racial capitalism, um, but he did um, he, but he began some kind of early theorizations about the relationship between race uh, and capitalism. And so that's something, you know, so there's this kind of early tradition that, that, that Du Bois has. You see similarly with folks like Eric Williams um, in Capitalism and Slavery, where he talks about, he's, he's getting, he's trying to figure out, or actually he makes, the case, he makes the argument that effectively racism becomes a product of slavery, right? And effectively racism therefore becomes kind of a product of, cap, of a particular mode of, of, of capitalist production at a definite historic uh, moment. Then you go on to Oliver Cromwell Cox, who is then thinking about capitalism in a kind of global context Right, and he starts to think about racism a little earlier uh, than, than Eric Williams. And then of course, um, the phrase racial capitalism that most people are familiar with in terms of Cedric Robinson's use. Um, Cedric Robinson is absolutely talking about racism as something that um, in many ways kind of predates capitalism and coincides with the um, emergence of capitalism. And so there's this long history therefore of, of this kind of concept of racial capitalism um, being a product or a kind of inheritance of the radical uh, Black political economy uh, tradition. Now, in terms of the race and class debates, I just want to read um, a couple passages from the actual article that um, I think are useful for thinking about another particular inheritance that the Black radical, uh, that the radical Black political co economy tradition has provided us with. During the early 20th century, Black radicals like Chandler Owens and A. Philip Randolph, who you saw on the slides earlier, were persuaded by the standard socialist party line that, quote, racism was merely a feature of capitalism. Kill the latter and the former would wither away. And some of you have probably heard, um, you know, some socialists or, or uh, socialist adjacent or communist adjacent folks making this argument today. It's class, right? Not race. Uh, this view held that organizing against white supremacy and forging all black labor unions was reactionary and constituted a distraction from the central task of building a global interracial working class movement aimed at abolishing the capitalist labor relationship. Class in this traditional Marxist reading uh, was more significant than race. This brand of Marxist thought, which Randolph would eventually jettison, organizing the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925, has been viewed with skepticism by many within the radical black tradition. Concern that calls for class unity are used strategically to defend, if not expand, white racial supremacy. This skepticism, coupled with the socialist party's demonstrated hostility to racial equality in black workers, would force Randolph and other prominent black radicals like Hubert Harrison, founder of the first black political organization during the New Negro Movement, the Liberty League of, National Amer uh, of Negro Americans, and publisher of The Voice to defect from the party. Bringing to Marxism-Leninism their own, quote, history of Black radicalism, found in the autonomous efforts of Black organizations to analyze and fight Black subordination, end quote, 
radical black activists and intellectuals drew on and adopted concepts and frameworks from Marxism, but altered them to fit their own historical and contemporary uh, experiences. And so we know that um, these debates about race and class um, persist, right, even, even to this day. And that's something maybe, again, we can, we can engage more um, in the, in the Q&A. Um, and finally, another inheritance that we have is this concept of, of triple oppression. And so this is a concept that um, we owe in large part to, again, Claudia, uh, Claudia Jones. Um, and so Claudia Jones was born in the, in the Caribbean uh, in Trinidad, then moved uh, here to um, into the United States when she was about eight years old, and then was later actually um, deported uh, and would spend uh, the rest of her life in, in London, is a very kind of internationalist figure, um, a communist woman. Um, but she also produced this, um, this concept of triple oppression, right? And so if you, again, um, entertain me briefly, Race and class debates, while passionately focused on the quote Negro, Negro question, have often been silent and at times hostile to quote the women question. Carol Boyce Davies, a leading scholar of, black, of the black radical tradition, attributed this silence to quote the masculinist framings of black radicalism together with the legacy of Cold War anti-communism end quote. Her work as well as that of Eric McDuffie's among others reveals the important intellectual contributions that radical black women have made toward a liberatory black political economic theory. Claudia Jones's essay, An End to the Neglect of Problems of Negro Women, is one of the most important articles advancing the radical black political economy tradition during the middle of the 20th century. In this brilliant piece, Jones, a prominent Trinidadian born black communist, organizer and theorist, describes the unique position and political role black domestic women occupy during various periods of history. Her account of the quote, structural conditions of black women, that of triple exploitation, end quote, represented a rethinking of the Marxist Leninist concept of super exploitation, resolving that black women were the most exploited social class and as a result, the most revolutionary. She reminds us that quote, the Negro woman who combines in her status, the Negro woman who combines in her status of, uh, who combines in her, the status of worker, the Negro, and the woman is the vital link to this heightened political consciousness, end quote. It was racial discrimination, which Jones argues is, quote, prior to and not equal to the women question, end quote, that accounted for Black women being almost twice as likely as white women to be working in 1940. Thus, one of the central contributions of radical Black women like Jones to Black political economy lies in their uncovering that, quote, to be Black and woman was to be subjected to structures of domination through technologies of racialization, marginalization, relegation, sexualized oppression, neglect, social exclusion, and super exploitation. So we have these different um, inheritances, right, that I just kind of mentioned in the previous slide and, and earlier from the tradition of radical black political economy. And I'm arguing that these, uh, that this particular tradition must occupy a larger role in black studies if black studies is actually to achieve um, its transformationalist mission, which I would argue and, and others have argued is art is um, is kind of uh, is the actual origins right reflects the actual origins of um, black studies. Now, as many of you know, this is the only discipline actually uh, black studies that was off that was founded um, oftentimes through confrontation. Right, and with some uh, institutions actually being founded uh, as a result of students arming themselves and, and demanding um, that the university provide education uh, uh, courses, but also um, academic units that were relevant for the lives of black people and not just relevant, but transformational. Um, this, as we see right here in this particular quote from Manning Marable, as an outgrowth of black intellectual thought and political struggle, the objective of black studies is to use history and culture as tools through which people interpret their collective experience for the purpose of transforming their actual conditions and the totality of the society all around them. Now, this is a noble goal, of course, right? Um, and it is a goal that I'm sure many of us um, um, 
say that we espouse or, or maybe are, are committed to. But Black study versus Black studies, the latter being this kind of institutionalization into an academic, uh, into the academy, also brought with it certain kinds of contradictions, right? So one of those um, associated with institutionalization was this issue of professionalization, right? Actually being committed to the very values of the institution that one is entering in. So part of those values, right, of Black studies is making sure that you publish, um, especially for, for faculty and getting tenure, et cetera, and promotion, et cetera, making sure that you publish and publishing in particular kinds of journals. Um, making sure that you are doing, you know, um, um, making sure that you are doing kind of what's necessary to be successful um, in the institution, if that means, um, um, you know, service work, um, et cetera, right? So there are these kinds of limitations that can be associated with professionalization and advancement in the discipline could actually be taking time away from one's commitment to a kind of transformationalist uh, black studies. And that's especially the case Right uh, in the era in this kind of neoliberal era that I that I described earlier, where even less money is being uh, provided for humanities generally, especially for Black studies generally, um, and a lot of money is actually being you know is going to to other uh, academic units as well. And so the kind of um, so the value of the work, especially kind of transformational work, and uh, is not often there. Um, and so if that kind of transformational work is not valued, it stands to reason and is not, it is not by value. I mean, you know, it's not something that can get folks uh, tenure. It's not something that um, committees actually value as something, not just committee within the department, but actually committees in the broader university. If it's not something that's valued, it can actually lead folks, uh, black studies scholars to um, veer off and to pursue those kinds of research avenues that the institution does see as legible and does see as valuable. Um, and so what I'm, so my point is, can we actually envision um, a transformational Black studies today uh, in which a radical Black political economy is not only, uh, tradition is not only central or is not only more central, but is actually um, pushing the discipline itself. And so now, uh, in conclusion, uh, I want to kind of go back to those original questions, orienting questions that I that I brought up um, at the beginning of the presentation. Right? And so, what are the kinds of insights, concepts, and frameworks uh, that the tradition of radical Black political economy has offered us uh, to interrogate these roots that Robin Kelly mentioned at the beginning of the um, presentation? So, internationalism is one, right? Focusing on not just domestic depression but US imperialism and seeing the link between these. And so that's something that um, Claudia Jones, as I gave an example of, was excellent um, at doing as of course, Du Bois and, and, and many others. Uh, the concepts of tradition uh, of triple oppression, right? Um, as well as identity politics. So thinking about the Kambahi River Collective, um, these are um, further inheritances, racial capitalism, intraracial inequality and subjugation, um, these are all some of the some concepts and, and frameworks and ways of thinking that I think are, are very useful in helping us kind of excavate the roots of these forms of oppression today. In terms of thinking about a transformationalist vision of Black studies, um, I think one of the things that radical Black political economy can do is help us to understand the limits of the university or this institutionalization of Black studies and might actually help us to think more um, seriously about returning or at least thinking about how black study or right, something outside of the institution maybe can help to um, um, address those limitations uh, of the institutionalization of black studies. And it might very well be the case that, you know, through black study, we find that uh, the university itself is an institution that is hostile to the interests of black folks and might itself actually have to be um, undermined, right? Um, and so, there are some folks who've done some really important work on, on thinking about um, what that looks like to kind of be a subversive Black uh, uh, studies um, um, scholar. Also, this issue of praxis, thinking about not just theory, right, not just kind of the intellectual work that we do, but what is that intellectual, you know, how is that intellectual work connected to actual people, actual Black people, not, you know, um, and actual Black communities. Right, um, and so not speaking on behalf of people or for people, 
but working with people and actually being in many respects being um, 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 kind of servants of the people, right? And so that was also another kind of key um, um, goal of Black studies at, it, at, its, at its origins. And, and that's also connected to this issue of um, demanding grounding, right? And so of course, I'm thinking about Walter Rodney when I'm thinking about grounding and making sure that us as Black studies scholars are actually um, embedded in communities um, and, 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 and um, servants to those communities and not actually kind of reproducing some forms of exploitation uh, that, that um, we're, we're so familiar with. And so I think, um, yeah, that is it. I've reached the conclusion of my presentation. And so um, thank you all so much. And I'm open for questions, um, critiques, criticisms, whatever, whatever, whatever's on your mind. Thank you. AJ, you have a great sense of timing, not only in terms of your research interests, but also in terms of your presentation skills. You pretty much hit the mark in terms of where you should have ended. Perfect. So perfect. I was let's a little concerned about reading. <laughs> no, no, you did great. So let's open it up. Anyone who has questions, please uh, use the, the chat function uh, to raise those. We, we'd love to uh, uh, field those. I'll uh, offer just a, a couple of comments uh, myself uh, before those questions uh, come in. So uh, just as, as a anecdotal story of sorts, which uh, I think uh, reinforces your, your point regarding the lack of um, resources directed towards the study of uh, political economy within the lack studies. I and mean, the figure that you gave was just, you know, for economists. Now, of course, um, you know, the economy is comprised of more than just work and economics, uh, or, you know, we can recast it as uh, uh, the proper study of economics. If we look back to the classical uh, or political uh, economic tradition of the 19th century, but uh, of you know, only 1.75% of the Black Studies faculty uh, coming from an economics uh, background. I won't name names here. I typically do, but, but uh, at this point I won't. But a administrator from our institution uh, told me when I was briefly chair here that there will be no more economists hired in your department. They cost too much money. Oh, wow. uh, even though they don't cost all that much money, it, it certainly hints at uh, the attitude, I think, that some administrators have regarding Black studies. In other words, you know, let's just keep those uh, Black people happy by giving them a, a department. We really don't care what they do, as long as it doesn't cost us too much money. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, that uh, tendency is at work uh, still. Also, uh, you know, of course, we've seen this shift first away. And so you have that nice categorization in terms of looking at the black uh, radical political economy tradition of, um, you know, you have these three periodizations of uh, the development of that thought. And of course it was in the 1980s, which you frame as the neoliberal period that we saw this um, uh, movement away from political economy generally, whether it's in black studies or, or just generally. And of course, uh, you know, as you know, I think, uh, that was certainly linked to the many, depending upon uh, how you view them as victories or defeats, uh, political changes of the 1980s in terms of uh, the end of revolutionary movements, at least on the scale of state capture and the collapse of so many of these things. And so you know, within the academy, we just see the kind of withdrawal of uh, interest from a uh, political economy. But then, of course, you know, with the 2008 crisis, uh, the financial shock, we see this reemergence mm -hmm. of interest in political economy as economists uh, proper, at least many of them, not all of them. I mean, so you have you know, post Keynesians and others who got a lot right in terms of the run up to the uh, 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 2008 shock, but a lot of them, of course, got it wrong. And so uh, it, um, it put a big chink in their armor. And there was this return uh, to political economy as an area of interest. And, and, uh, we're, we're, and aside from yourself, I don't think we're, we're seeing uh, as many people entering into this uh, area within Black studies as we should. And hopefully you'll uh, represent uh, a, a, a needed movement in that direction. But you know, we, we see a lot more interest in political economy just generally since 2008. And I think uh, uh, you know, that's a, a very helpful development. If I can, uh, tender a few more observations. And of course, 
I'll certainly uh, stop once others wish to intercede with their comments and you know, hopefully they will. Uh, you know, thinking about why uh, uh, African-American labor in terms of that three periodization uh, scheme that you have, and it becomes important, of course, in the early to mid 20th century. I mean, we, we see not only this, as you were saying, increasing uh, industrialization, um, this shift of populations from rural areas to urban areas, uh, agriculture becoming just far more uh, efficient and, and you know, far fewer people are needed, but we also see the immigration spigot uh, turned off uh, to the United States. So you know, African-Americans African -Americans become quite important uh, from that perspective as a reserve army of labor that can be tapped uh, to uh, fill those needs. And of course it comes with some tensions as populations begin to you know, mix, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it, it opens uh, several opportunities to African-Americans, especially with unionization of labor, which of course sometimes you know, you know, is progressive. We look at the CIO and the AFL, of course, much less so, uh, but nonetheless, it uh, of course begins to create economic opportunities for African-Americans. And then of course, all that uh, comes undone as, as you've noted uh, with this uh, neoliberal uh, period. And, and uh, here, you know, African Americans become kind of an orphaned uh, reserve army of labor that you know is no longer needed, and we see many of these urban cores that you know suffer uh, significantly as a consequence. Uh, and and so this is something that me and you used to talk about a little bit, uh, you know. But I've been thinking about how the contradictions of neoliberalism are again of uh, making African-American labor increasingly needed. So, you know, we see these demographic shifts uh, that have occurred. In other words, we have uh, a lot of uh, older people, a lot of older white, white people, uh, um, low birth rates among the uh, white population just generally. And then in uh, much of this kind of de-industrialized uh, Midwestern core, these kind of reactionary conservative policies, which have served to push out <laughs> people. And so, you know, now you, you need labor actually to uh, uh, take care of all sorts of functions that, you know, uh, previously were handled and, and now no longer can be. And so it's interesting, you know, we're in terms of, you know, the language that we see within the academy now, uh, especially state institutions where Republicans are in charge of state legislatures of, you know, workforce development and all the rest. It's like, you know, now, oh, now, oh African-Americans are, are valuable again. You know, we, <laughs> we, we actually need them in terms of work. So all of that is, I think, uh, quite interesting. And these are discussions that we can have uh, at a later point, perhaps. Uh, uh, let me open up the floor to some people who have posted questions too, but I'm really looking forward to discussing some of these trends with you uh, in the future, if your uh, patience and uh, interest permits. But our first one is from the venerable uh, Professor Patrick Belgard Smith, person that you know. And Patrick says, bravo, exclamation point. Limits of black studies departments became a tool for pacification and co-optation of persons framed by universities and overarching necessities of US society itself. Scholarship as subversive hard road uh, period that might think he probably meant to include something else there, but he says, happy to see the inclusion of gender and of Caribbean scholars and history in your mix. I am sensitive to these issues. Uh, so happy to receive that comment from Patrick and uh, let's take another uh, one here and then you can respond uh, uh, with any comments that you might have. This is from an anonymous attendee about theory and praxis colon, can black entrepreneurship combined with black uh, uh, consciousness and activism be effective in this context of neoliberalism? So AJ, any uh, thoughts about uh, those remarks? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I, I appreciate Dr. Uh, Belgard Smith's uh, comments because yeah, I think that um, there's, there's, a, there's a very long tradition I think actually this is very important given um, if if folks are familiar with this movement, the um, um, I think it's American Descendants of Slaves movement, the ADOS movement, 
Um, and so one of the things that the ADOS movement is kind of focused on is, is American descendants of slaves. In other words, African immigrants, right, um, or, or any kind of black immigrants to the United States, generally speaking, um, they uh, are not so concerned about in some, at best or at worst, or sometimes hostile uh, towards those interests and believe, for example, specifically that um, it's ADOS, for example, that should be receiving reparations, right? Um, and so what that does though, is it there and then excludes um, any Blacks either from the Caribbean, Africans from the Caribbean, uh, any African immigrants from anywhere else outside the, the United States that come to the United States. So, and I think what's so um, problem, I mean, there's a lot of issues with that. I think one of them though, is that it completely erases this history of Caribbean uh, migration, African migration uh, to the United States and Caribbean migration in particular. And, and what's, what's so um, harmful about that as well is that it is a lot of these Caribbean scholars that, especially during the um, during the kind of new Negro uh, movement all the way up until the present, that have that have um, been very influential in contributing to this kind of radical Black political economy tradition. Um, and so I, I'm since so I really appreciate Dr. Smith's uh, Belgard Smith's um, comments um, about about the role that Caribbean scholars play in this in this um, analysis because I think that that is very important and I think it's something that we need to think not only about the contribution of Caribbean scholars but African scholars um, as, as well to thinking about um, 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 this kind of development of of, of of this of this particular tradition. Um, in terms of the, the second question, theory and practice, can Black entrepreneurship, right? So the, <clears throat> the way that I see this question, um, the first question I think I have is like, what does the questioner mean by effective, right? Um, and I say that because what this kind of reminds me of is this is a kind of belief that um, Black capitalism can be a kind of panacea for Black oppression. And um, as somebody who's advocating, you know, radical, the radical Black political economy tradition, I would have to say, uh, you know, absolutely not, you know, that Black capitalism is absolutely not um, a pathway um, for uh, liberation. So for example, and so in other words, Black entrepreneurship, um, I don't think can uh, necessarily uh, get us, you know, kind of can help to achieve this this goal of of liberation. And so, um, you know, I I think that what one can sure right. So I think that some folks can benefit from blank from black entrepreneurship, right? So there is right now, for example, you have there was just a um, a conference at Howard University a little while back, um, and this conference was about black. Uh, people who were interested in cryptocurrencies. And so this idea was that Black, you know, um, and these were folks who were very critical of, of, of white supremacy, of slavery, um, of, 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 of kind of white racism more broadly, um, and its effects on Black people, uh, both past and present. But their belief was that they could actually, that cryptocurrency changes the game, right? Because it's not actually controlled by the state. Um, never, never mind that these are still, you know, investments that are dependent upon capitalism in, in the kind of orientation and, and imaginations of, of, of capitalist development. Um, they believe that, nevertheless, that this kind of invest in, investing in this kind of coin can actually um, help to achieve uh, Black liberation. And, and it's just it's just never um, been the case. I mean, you have folks like um, Jay-Z now and, and, and others who are... Um, who are now trying to get into housing and provide low-income housing for uh, Will Smith? I think has teamed up with him to try to provide like low-income housing uh, for Black people. I, I, I would I would caution against those types of um, um, uh, you know our kinds of investments in those kinds of um, those kinds of projects. I mean, again, if if you know, I would I would I would again kind of recommend that article that I mentioned by by Robin Kelly. Because effectively, it's like saying, you know, can, can if it's respect to black entrepreneurship, and, and again, I'm not so, you know, and I don't want to just kind of overlook the um, part about a kind of black um, consciousness or a kind of activism, because I, I think that absolutely you can be well intentioned, right? You can um, 
be well-meaning. And I would, I would actually argue that, but, but still be kind of reproducing um, Black oppression because these, this, this thing about entrepreneurship is not a collective, it's not about addressing the kind of collective conditions of Black folks. It's about, by definition, entrepreneurship, it's about what you can do as an individual, right? And it's not about a political movement. It's not about changing structures. And that is what, um, and institutions. And that is, that is precisely what the radical black political economy tradition is focused on, right? It's anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist. It means abolishing um, those particular systems that would actually um, make themselves amenable uh, to, or at least those systems in which black entrepreneurship would, would, would operate. I will say, um, you know, if one is thinking about Black entrepreneurship, maybe as black co-ops, I mean, uh, 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 cooperative uh, kinds of economic projects. I mean, I think that that is, I'm, I'm more sympathetic to that. Um, but I kind of, again, you know, think of those projects as, to, to borrow the language of, of the Black Panthers, maybe projects pending revolution, right? So um, I don't think that, again, even black co-ops can, you know, it's not that establishing black co-ops will abolish capitalism, right? Um, but I think it's something to help try to kind of maintain or to try to address the immediate needs um, of, of, of Black folks today. Well, thank you, AJ, for an insightful uh, presentation, one which gives me no small measure of hope in terms of the uh, possible future directions of Black studies and for engaging the questions from our audience. We are so looking forward to seeing what you produce in the coming years. We'll be looking very closely. Uh, and I consider you a, a, a hopeful direction, again, for, for uh, uh, intellectual production in the tradition of uh, Black uh, radical political economy. Thank you so much for enjoying us. Let's stay in touch. Keep well, as our old former uh, department chair, Winston Van Horn, used to say. And we will uh, 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 constantly be uh, engaging you uh, as, as you uh, thrive in your new career at UC Santa Barbara. Do take care. Thank you so much. And thank you all for attending. Appreciate it and for the questions. <laughs>